Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast presented by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Today, I have a guest with uh, quite a unique set of experiences and a very, very interesting company. Today, I want to welcome Jeremy Patoka, who is the founder and principal software architect of an organization called Pre-Sales Leader. Jeremy, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for having me, Ted. Um, I'd like to talk, if I could, a little bit and explore what is your work experience prior to starting your own business? So I had a pretty interesting um, journey into the technology space. I actually, my academic formation was in Spanish. So I uh, actually was a Spanish teacher in a public school in Pennsylvania for about five years, uh, lived abroad, dabbled in teaching at the college level, actually, uh, and had a really neat opportunity to do more within schools with technology. And um, I did that kind of like in addition to my teaching workload and had an opportunity to leave teaching altogether and just go straight into technology. So uh, that was the very beginnings. I was a, a Pennsylvania State mm -hmm. teacher for, uh, like I said, five and a half, six years, and then um, transitioned into the world of ERP, which, you know, in case some of the listeners don't know what that acronym is, it's fancy word for accounting software enterprise resource planning software. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked for a small, uh, what we would call ISV independent software vendor in Connecticut that focused on nonprofit accounting software. So they were the developer and implementer and reseller of a solution called Nonprofit Plus. And um, so it was great. It was a small company, like less than 10 people. So I got a lot of great experience project managing implementing, converting data, um, all, you know, you wear lots of hats in a company that size. Sure. Um, and then, uh, so that was really my first, my first, uh, jump into ERP. I wanted to focus a little bit more. So I went to, uh, a very similar company in the same family of technology within the same kind of ERP ecosystem called Acumatica. Mm -hmm. Uh, went to one of the largest resellers of Sage and Acumatica in, in North America called SWK Technologies. And I ran their Acumatica solutions engineering team. So, you know, okay. along the way, started with teaching, got lot to wear lots of hats. And then my last company I worked at before I started uh, technology leader companies, pre-sales leader, was um, focusing on this role of what we call solution engineering. There's lots of people call it lots of things, solution consulting, solution engineering, sales engineering, solutions architecture. Um, depending on who you talk to, they can mean different things. They're all roughly the same thing. Um, and it was a great marriage of my my communication and teaching experience. You know, if you can teach eighth mm -hmm. grader Spanish, it's pretty mm -hmm. easy to be able to demo software. So I yeah. was uh, that's the role of a solution engineer is demonstrating solutions, typically within a software platform to an end client. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going through this learning curve um, with other organizations. You're seeing how the business works. You're seeing the software, how it is implemented, the selling techniques used, things like that. Where did you start developing that idea that there's a problem out here and we could develop a business around this and be a little bit unique? How did, how did that incubate in your mind? Yeah, I've, I've always had... Um, an entrepreneurial side to me, even like going back to my teens, I, I was the kids shoveling snow and, you know, driving my dad's truck around with a lawnmower and landscaping stuff in the summer. So um, I just liked, I don't know, that was just always natural to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for, for me, when I was at my prior, uh, my prior employer, um, they actually, it was right in the pandemic and in tw early, early 2020, 
I remember a, a manager came to me and said, hey, we, we literally just staffed up your team. Um, what's the worst case scenario look like, right, for, for the sales organization overall in your mind? And what does it look like for the pre-sales team, the solution architecture team? Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, <clears throat> usually our role is pretty protected, right? Like we're the last people to go. But yeah. in 2020, it's like you never knew it was going to happen. And it actually wound up being a wonderful year for SaaS. It was a wonderful year for technology. Like in a lot of ways, it spooled digital transformation for folks big time. Like people that yeah. were using green screen technology, they realized like, oh, we can't work from home. There's no way to remote into this old IBM yeah. server. So it was a great yeah. year. We yeah. actually wound up hiring more and growing a lot. But I couldn't get that idea out of my head. Like, what would I do? And, um, you know, in in the yeah. in technology, a lot of people, when they think of, of working in a, a technology or working in tech, they think of big tech, Google, Oracle, Salesforce, right? Massive behemoth organizations. The reality, though, is that there's like a massive market of small and mid-sized enterprise software companies. It could be yeah. like the one I worked for in Connecticut, 10 people. The one I worked for in North Jersey yeah. before starting this company that was 250 people, you know, 40 million in revenue. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. there's a ton of that out there. And those size companies, especially within an, an ecosystem like um, Acunatica, you, know, you got different parties, right? There's the, the publisher that makes the software and then a channel of resellers that are supposed to go out and sell it and implement it. It's like your typical distributor model. Right. But there's that model actually yeah. is why our business thrives. That model is why you know, a lot of times the publisher looks at the channel and says, hey, channel partners, you should be doing this. And then the channel partners look at the publisher and say, like, yeah, we'll start, but you should also support us in doing that. And yeah. uh, and, and that's really what we do. We just fill in gaps that exist in, in that family of companies and that ecosystem of technology between the publisher and the channel. Um, yeah. so, so that was an idea I just couldn't get out of my head. And yeah. um, I that's so I, I started the company, you know, mid 2021 basically okay so what was the catalyst that said this is the time this is where i take the plunge i'm making the move you know i it was really a terrible time to make the move because we just had a second child so um you know it was interesting uh conversations with my wife Brittany, trying to tell her like hey i know we're having a second (laughs) kid um i think I, i think we should do this now you know um, but it was, it just seemed like a good time, um, to, to do it. If I was going to ever step out and actually give it a whirl, it just seemed like a good yeah. time in our life where there wasn't going to be a lot of other change. Like we weren't planning on moving again. Um, it seemed mm-hmm. outside of, uh, adding to our family. It seemed like a relatively stable time for me. If I was going to mm-hmm. do it. I was either going to do it then. Cause you got to think mid 2021, I already sat on that idea for six to 12 months and was slowly forming yeah. that over the year. So uh, for me, it was go time. Yeah. So when you started the business, do you remember, can you go back and from an emotional standpoint, say, these are the emotions that I went through as I actually walked through that door. <laughs> I went to the other side of the desk, so to speak. And I started looking at this as this is my own business. This is my baby. So now I got to start growing this. What was the emotional experience like that you, you went through? You know, you prepare for the worst. That's the beginning. You just don't know Mm -hmm. how it's going to go and you prepare Mm -hmm. for the worst, you know? And -hmm. that's what I, day one, I was just like, well, it might take me a while to build this up. I'm prepared for that. You know, I'm prepared financially to starve for a little bit. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't want to, but if I have to, Mm -hmm. we can. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, the, the, the risk, you know, I think in the in the life of a founder of a startup, especially an early stage startup, the risk isn't like one big wave you've got to overcome. It mm-hmm. really kind of happens in multiple waves. Mm-hmm. And um, that first one was just taking the leap. Um, mm-hmm. I was fortunate to literally start the company and have three pretty good sized clients, people I knew from the past that were mm-hmm. signed up on, you know, day zero. So how day mm-hmm. one, I, was, I had revenue, which was important. Um, we're also a subscription sure. service. So our revenue is, is, is six months at a time, you know, it, um, you know, monthly, but it's a commitment. It's not just like a one-timer team. Sure. Gig. 
which has really been sure. a differentiator and, and a huge way of how we've gone from just me in August of 2021 to um, we'll probably mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. be about 24 employees by middle of this year. And, you know, it's been okay. two and a half years. So, so yeah, but, but you know, you get that wave. Uh, it's always like, I was wishing that you get over that hump once and then that was it. But then you, yeah. you kind of, you, you have to face, if you want to continue to grow, you're constantly facing the, the risk and the question of like, should we do this? Should we not do mm -hmm. this? So let's take a look at it in an organization as it evolves and it grows. It's got to model the market. It's got to mimic what your vendors, if you will, you, that you're servicing and your customer needs are. That means you have to understand how to implement and manage change. Yep. That's what change is. I'm implementing it. So how has that whole, I'm going to say, lesson of implementation, how did you deal with learning how to implement new things as a business owner, implement the culture, implement onboarding an employee or implement changes that you're doing with a customer? Yeah. What were the challenges there? You know, I like to think that my teaching career made me really well prepared for all of this. Um, mm -hmm. I think when, when you, when you, especially in your early years as an educator, and even in your training and you know university programs, sort of teacher sort of programs, like ev everything is really planned. It's like I have a lesson plan for today. Mm -hmm. I have a curriculum for how these students are going to be evaluated. Um, I have mm -hmm. an end goal, and then here's the steps to get there. Like you, you're not just teach. It might appear that way to a lot of people, but like there's a lot of science and curriculum and planning and strategy that goes into I'm teaching you this today because you're going to take a test on this in two weeks and then it's going to show yeah. up on like a state exam next year. So yeah. I, that was ingrained in my brain. Like you, we're not doing this just to do it. There's a reason. So I mm -hmm. think for me, I, I that's just how we implement change. I mean, we build out a plan. Uh, I literally still use a rubric for my team. Like mm -hmm. you know, one of our biggest challenges is people in the process because we're a services firm. So mm -hmm. part of part of us implementing change internally even is we we constantly have new people that have not done this job before. Mm -hmm. And 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 we have to have a really refined system and process right. and follow that. And right. and typically like you don't find any of that in a startup. Like there's just like let's Wing try it. different things right and yep. um yep. but also combine that like teaching mentality with the fact that i implemented erp systems for eight years before i started this right in, in various phases like yeah. i i learned a lot about yeah. business process and implementing change and sitting down right. and being a consultant listening to clients feedback and then needing to go implement right. that change in their own system so, um, yeah. so it was a unique, it was a unique, uh, sometimes we say we, we have a saying around here that we like to make things harder than they should be, but that's mm -hmm. also because we, we've seen like what happens when you don't mm -hmm. maybe follow through with the process, or if you don't get the right people on board early, it can really, um, can really derail any, any size project. Yeah. So you have great experience in implementing ERP systems, which are a huge challenge. Anybody that's implemented ERP systems knows what that challenge is like. What lessons did you learn through the implementation of ERP? What what were the main what are the main challenges and problems people have implementing the ERP system? Yeah, projects fail notoriously for a lot of reasons. I mean, you can just go to Google and see big name brands that have published legal battles over ERP projects that have failed for millions of dollars in many years. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of the work that I've done has actually been within mid-market. So for us, mm -hmm. it's you know, typically companies under 500 million in revenue, um, mm -hmm. even under 100 million in revenue. So, which is fun because you're working with folks that uh, you're working directly with the people that are actually growing their own businesses and doing the work. It's not like there's mm -hmm. a massive team of $10 million project, anything like that. I mean, we're talking about projects that are anywhere between 500 to 2000 hours is the, mm -hmm. the space I've worked in. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'd say the biggest three, couple of the big reasons why projects fail or why they can be challenging is you don't have the people on board. Technology mm-hmm. by itself actually doesn't do anything. Mm-hmm. You know, AI is starting to change that a little bit where, you know, you can actually automate more to do without like less tethered to a person. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, you can unplug an AI. It's a computer still, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So much about business is, and even change is interpersonal. And, you mm-hmm. know, if people feel threatened by an internal change, they're not going to support it. Mm-hmm. And if they don't support it, it's not going to be successful. Cause again, you could implement, you know, I could implement the most expensive ERP system for a team that mm-hmm. doesn't want it and it won't do anything. Mm-hmm. I could implement QuickBooks for a company that shouldn't be in QuickBooks anymore, but the people love it and they'll be more yeah. successful with that. <laughs> So, so when you walk into a prospect and or client and you see that they don't have the right people, let's just say that they don't have the right attitude. Some of them are retired and saying, hey, I don't want to undertake a project like this. I'm out of here in six months, yeah. whatever it might be. How do you address that problem? Because that's going to affect implementation. Yeah. Yeah. Part of it's just qualifying is the project even, is it the right time to, to do this project? Okay. Um, you know, we we always when we kick off even in, on the pre-sale side of our business when we kick off a demo or even a discovery rather you know, I always kind of throw the question out there you guys didn't just wake up today and say let's go through the pain of implementing a new ERP it's like the, doing a heart <laughs> transplant on your business yeah. people don't really right. want to do that right heart and brain but, transplant <laughs> that's right so there's got to be some reason your your technology is expiring and you have to move because like your server is not going to be supported in a year mm-hmm. or um, you had fraud or mm-hmm. there's a new controller, new CFO who said, I, you know, we have to move. Like mm-hmm. there's, there's really only three or four reasons people change in our world. And, and mm-hmm. most of them are the ones that, or, or you've grown, you started on QuickBooks, 1 million, now you're a hundred million. You, you really need to get on something else that's more auditable, for example. Yeah, so yeah. we start those questions early. Um, and like a lot of times if the stars don't align, we either won't take the project on, or if we do take the project on, we're going to add like 50% to the consulting budget. Honestly, yeah. um, just because yeah. they're yeah. they're going to need more facilitation, more project management, more business process has nothing to do with actually configuring the ERP, just more straight right. consulting. Um, mm-hmm. I actually just kicked off a project a few weeks ago, really successful company. Um, same story as a lot of folks are on QuickBooks and they're growing. And we actually added another line in their implementation SOW that's just financial business process renew, like f- f- financial business process reengineering, right? Mm-hmm. Because they just, mm-hmm. I can tell they don't have the right internal controls. If we don't mm-hmm. do that and we still try to implement the system, they don't have the people, they don't have the internal controls. I mean, they're just going to be really frustrated with it. Mm-hmm. Well, my congratulations to you for doing that because obviously the difference between a good and bad client makes a huge difference in your bottom line, their bottom line, and just the whole work environment you're working in. How does your teaching background help you evaluate, here's what they're going to need, and here's how we help them implement this change? Yeah. You know, um, a lot of it is actually just doing what you said. A lot of the, you know, a lot of times folks like to just show whatever their software does, right? And you could call it consultative selling. You could call it just being a good consultant. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, f- from my teaching background, like if, if, if I knew that the, f- it was an honors class and an AP class, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And those students already had a base of knowledge. We focused on the stuff that they really needed to know. I didn't just mm-hmm. like, Oh, well it's in the textbook. Let's just do it cover to cover. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so same type of thing. It's like when you sit down with somebody, what are the big reasons? What are, how can we solve what, in each department? What are like three to five challenges they have today? And just mm-hmm. listen. I mean, so much of it is just listening mm-hmm. because it, it's going to help change management. It's going to help everyone feel heard. 
it's mm-hmm. going to help people get excited about the project rather than just like this top down, hey, we're buying a new system and you're going to need to live with this. That's why we love yeah. discovery. You have mm-hmm. to do discovery. You have to sit down and understand why. Why do you want to implement this change? Mm-hmm. If you don't know why you're going to do this, I, I literally tell people this in the sales process. If you don't know why you're going to do this, then you shouldn't do it at all. Because yeah. this project, yeah. you know, this is going yeah. to be hard. There's going to be at yeah. least two or three times in this implementation, you're going to wonder, did we make the right decision? Did we buy right. the right software? And right. If you don't have a strong enough why for why yeah. you're doing the project, yeah. I, I just wait until you figure that out and then do it because yeah. you're, that's that's what's going to keep you alive when yeah. you're when you're in that trough of disillusionment as as um we call it. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about that question: Why? What's the <laughs> why behind your business, your organization? Yeah, selling technology is hard. Implementing technology is hard. Um, mm-hmm. The why, you know, having a distributor network like what we work in, where Acumatica, the ERP system that we largely work uh, within that ecosystem of companies, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that you can't buy Acumatica from Acumatica. It's, and, and you shouldn't. Mm-hmm. It's a great model. You buy it from yeah. a local, yeah. regional, industry specific reseller that knows garage door manufacturing, right? And, yeah. and they take Acumatic and implement it for those folks. And these people do furniture and these people do nonprofits. So it's yeah. a great go-to-market model. But the nature of that just means you have a ton of small businesses all kind of taking this platform to customers. Mm-hmm. So um, that's really our why. It's a challenging thing to do. Those companies don't have the luxury of having a bench of stud, thoroughbred, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. solution architects. They, they could not, it's just not financially feasible for many of them. And even mm-hmm. if it was, even if they could afford them, that, that solution architect wouldn't really feel fulfilled. Um, there's mm-hmm. high turnover with those folks. Cause like you take that person and you ask them to do project management you ask them to do consulting work, you, you know, now they're doing like people like to focus. So um, mm-hmm. that's really what I provide. It's why we've had um, really no t- turnover since I started the business. We've got mm-hmm. great people and it, they know what it's like to be on the other side. And mm-hmm. they're like, wow, this is kind of a unique thing because we get to focus. We get to focus mm-hmm. on what we do. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, we're just, we don't have like a complex digital marketing strategy or anything like that. It's our mm-hmm. business is built on a reputation in the channel, referrals, and just mm-hmm. helping our, our VAR clients grow and our end clients of Acumatica mm-hmm. actually get value out of the software. Okay. So as you build the company, you know your why, you know how you need to differentiate or you want to differentiate. Tell me a little bit about the culture and how you implemented the culture that you have now and how that helps you. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, especially as the less I do of the actual consulting work and the, the sales demos and things like that, uh, my, my role has really become chief culture officer. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, for us, there's a couple differentiators. One, about 60, 60, maybe 70% of our staff are actually um, based here in Lancaster. Mm-hmm. So it's it's odd to think that like in person in our industry is a differentiator, but it really is. I actually mm-hmm. spoke to one of our clients this morning that was like, where do you find these people? And mm-hmm. I was like, you know, I find them within my local network they they find mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. I'm willing to take a chance on a teacher because mm-hmm. I know could, they can successfully. So we're yeah. looking to transition out of a different career path. Nurse, teacher, um, you know, yeah. part time pastor. I have all of that. All of those types of profiles here, mm-hmm. and no one would have given them a shot, right? Mm-hmm. I have a good system and process to train people to onboard people. And because they wouldn't be working remote, which is the, really the common thing in our industry is that they would be a remote employee, they get to be a really good sponge here and they get to learn really mm-hmm. fast. Um, one of my highest producing SEs last year on the sales side, SE solution engineer on the sales side, um, mm-hmm. you know, had a record breaking year and two and a half years ago, he was a teacher. So mm-hmm. you know, I have a system to take people from point A to point B 
And um, I, I hire on character, I hire on soft skills, and the technology and the mm-hmm. other components we can really backfill in. I, I can't do the reverse as easily. Okay. So that's right. that's a big part of our culture. I think that's what makes us different. Um, okay. So the so, inverse part, yeah. So culture enables you, it either enables you to scale your business, optimize, or it's going to prevent you from growing. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the evolution of your organization. Um, as the market evolves, I'm sure you're having more services and more products, et cetera, that you might be supporting, um, divisions you may have started. Tell me a little bit about the uh, evolution of your organization. So we started as pre-sales as a service. As a pre-sales leader, we helped um, resellers of software and publishers of software, software creators sell their own software, right? Oftentimes, they're the mm-hmm. worst at doing the demos. It's like their baby. Let me show you everything it does, even if you only need to buy it. Yeah. You're buying it for 10% of, of what the software actually does. Yeah. So that's where we started. Yeah. Um, if you think of... I'm going to take a little philosophical tour and come back and answer that directly, but I think it's going to be really good for the listeners to participate in here. Um, You know, the role of pre-sales is really becoming an outdated term. Pre-sales historically is the person that does the demos in a more complex sales technology environment. Okay. So Mm -hmm. you have a salesperson, you've got a pre-sales person, they're a team. Salesperson has their job and their roles and responsibilities. The pre-sales person is like a technical salesperson. And the way you used to sell technology pre-cloud was Mm -hmm. I'm going to sell you a license, a floppy disk, a CD-ROM. You know, we're going to install it on your server or your computer. This is how we, you know, think of all the ERPs out there. You did like that Peachtree, you know, most of the Sage Mm -hmm. products. Mm -hmm. Any legacy software, you bought a license and then you paid maintenance. The maintenance basic gave you some basic upgrades, okay? Mm-hmm. Fast forward to the cloud. And, and by the way, on the implementation side, there was a singular point in time project. And then mm-hmm. after that, you went into support. That mm-hmm. was really it. That's how the world mm-hmm. of software implementations worked pre-cloud. Buy mm-hmm. software, have a big bang project, go live, don't go live. <laughs> if you're live, then you're in a support model and you pay a small fee each year, but you're hosting it on your own, right? You're doing all these mm-hmm. other things. In the SaaS world, it wasn't just a hardware change. It wasn't just, let's move the software from your server and your office to a cloud somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. So you don't have to manage the IT. The other component that has changed now is the speed at which these software publishers are delivering new technology, new features, new modules to the cloud. It's easier to mm-hmm. do that. The way you pay mm-hmm. for it has changed. You don't pay... year one, and then $20,000 every year after that. You're paying Mm -hmm. $50,000 a year, $75,000 a year for every year you're subscribing to the software. Mm -hmm. That model has really forced the implementation methodology and the customer experience to change. Talk Mm -hmm. to any cloud provider and they'll tell you that. So so really, if if we viewed pre-sales as a way that was aligned to an initial software purchase, implement it, and then there's no reason for a solution consultant to be around after you go live, if the whole model has changed, the roles have to change. That's really the best description of how I think we're building our companies. So we have the the product marketing company, which is really um, solution engineers or solution architects, product marketing specialists who are helping at the very top of funnel for software companies. Okay. Mm -hmm. How, how do we build great collateral that actually gets to the business objectives of what your end prospects, you know, Mr. Software Company, Mrs. Software Company want? Uh, our, our next mm-hmm. company, the pre-sales leader, is still the core. That's the middle of funnel. That's with, you know, the traditional pre-sales role. But then our mm-hmm. third company, the business consulting leader, that is handling the other touch points of solutions architecture, solutions engineering within the customer life cycle. So now when mm-hmm. the customer buys, we're advocating that a solution engineer stays on, solution architect stays on for phase one of the project, right? They've sometimes spent six months gathering requirements and doing demos with a client. They should probably stick mm-hmm. around, make sure the implementers have some time to catch up, right? And, and some implementers have done that in the legacy world. Most of them, I would say, have not. 
But it really mm-hmm. makes a big difference when the the guy or gal you spent the sales process with from a technical and business mm-hmm. objective alignment is around for the mm-hmm. first three months of a 12-month project. Or at least someone from the team or mm-hmm. someone with that skill set. So that's what we have. We have a separate team mm-hmm. now that does that post-sale design work. They're like, think about building a house. We're the architects building the blueprints, right? And and they're also not right. going to then put their construction hat on and start nailing studs together and things like that. They were going to move on to another project that their skill set is architecture and blueprint, right? Mm-hmm. Also, after someone goes live, right? Now you're live. Even think of the softwares that we work within. Um, prior to 2020, no one was integrated with Teams, Microsoft Teams. Now everything's mm-hmm. integrated with Teams. I can guarantee mm-hmm. you like 90% of the folks out there have not even – they have it's a Teams integration that they never turned on, or there's yeah. a new feature in the software that was released because now you have quarterly or biannual releases, and they've never leaned in further. So again, pre-sales is not this one-time thing. Now it's continuous. So we have solutions yeah. engineer, solution consultants that actually, after someone's live, come back in and say, "What's changed in your business? What has? Mm-hmm. Had, did you implement this module?" There's this new feature that could provide, you know, a lot of value and actually reduce your working man hours by 16 hours a month. You're paying for it. It's just not set up. So um, it's really this whole philosophical change of what's the role of a solutions person in the customer lifecycle. And we're Mm -hmm. building our companies in a way that we can actually touch pretty much any point in the customer lifecycle with a a high quality solution architecture experience. Mm -hmm. So. You started your business, it was, I'm going to say, a more simple idea. The tasks, the problems you addressed, that evolved as software and the market needs addressed. What's your secret to implementing that change in your business? What tools did you use? How did you go about implementing those changes culturally and even just from a mindset of who you are, the why in the business? Yeah, number one is I have the right people. Um, Without the right people, the any initiatives wouldn't move forward. My um, kind of co-founding leadership mm-hmm. team of of three other fellows, I've worked with all of them in the past and trust them, and they're headed in the same direction. We're not fighting against each other. So the people element to that uh, is like a non. It's amazing what you can do when you take that component off the table, right? We yeah. we have yeah. not always agreement, which is healthy, but we have alignment in where we're headed. Um, yeah. Aside from that, you know, we're uh, the the thing about being like a solution consultant or solution engineer is you um, like there's an organizational element to it, like that Mm -hmm. you understand what's our requirement, where are we headed, how do we get there, right? You have to Mm -hmm. do that with all. We have to do that with all of our clients. So for us, getting that group together to be able to actually then implement change and follow through on things has been. you know, I would say a pretty smooth process. We don't do things as fast as we'd like, um, but we've really Mm -hmm. built out the technologies that we use to support us in any implementation of change that we want. One of the first systems we implemented was Monday.com. It's a project management system, Mm -hmm. keeps everybody accountable. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, it's so the mixture of actually building a plan, putting deadlines on it, living by that Mm -hmm. and having the right people marching in the right direction is mm-hmm. is I would say just in summary the way that we implement any change internally, which we change things all the time here. <laughs> well, I again, my congratulations, people. The the level of person, the talent, skill levels of a person that you surround, the people you surround yourself with, makes all the difference. And then the other thing that you do is the plan, the communication of the plan and details, and that's what brings alignment. And then everybody just acts on it. So. I'm going to say for your organization, you found three steps in implementation that are key. People, the plan, project management, acting on it. And then always communicating, aligning, going back and addressing those things that are falling short. So my last question, where are you going in the future? What do you see down the road? AI is coming. What changes do you see are going to be affecting your organization Um, the, 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 the solutions that you sell and how the market may be accepting them? Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to growing in in the ERP ecosystems. I think it's a great place to be. 
AI is definitely going to play a component to that. Um, but I feel like, you know, even outside of that, there's enough old ERP software that's going to literally yeah. stop working in the next five to seven years that yeah. um, even the industry outlook is 13% growth within that space with like kind of no net change due to AI. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're, we're excited to, again, we, we always, there's always this tension internally about, do we become a software platform? Do we write a software platform? But our why is, you know, helping other people do that. So when we bring it yeah. back to that, it, yeah. we kind of say, no, we're not going to actually, you know, try to do some sort of venture to create a software platform or, or leverage AI. But what we will do, getting back to our why, is we'll figure out a way to help other clients do that. Because again, our whole why is they don't have the resources to to do what they do, so we help them with that. And and that's exactly what we're going to do with um, artificial intelligence. How can our clients adopt that? How can we help them with that? Okay. On the business consulting side, that's a relatively new venture, right? We've We've kind of gone down as I went through that narrative of like the customer life cycle, product marketing to pre-sales, middle funnel to post-sales solution design. And our latest venture with the optimization as a service and project rescue as a service, which is really for people that are farther down the line in the customer experience, um, is really just three months old at this point. But it's one of the most exciting elements of our business. You know, from, mm-hmm. from our perspective, it's another recurring revenue stream. That is oftentimes 12 months at a time. And um, every client I talk to that's on any piece of ERP software, they all nod their heads and they're like, yeah, when I log in, I, I don't see the dashboard that I thought I would when I bought this. Like I see the homepage and there's nothing on it. And mm-hmm. like, yeah, we never did implement that module or, you know what? It does have some cool AI features but we actually are just using this as our GL and AP and AR and standard financial reporting. I mean, that's just, and it's no one's fault. Projects are hard, right? Implementing ideas are easy, like implementation's hard, right? That's how we kick this off. So, so what happens is that you set things aside in that, that big bang project. And, and then, but what people need to do now, because eventually you do have to go live on something, but it it might be 40% of what you wanted. And, mm-hmm. and I think there's a negative connotation yep. about that. That's okay. The, what's not okay is to not take that another 10% your first year after going live and another 10% the next year. So that's really, yeah. I'm excited to, to help you know, optimize. That's optimization as a service. It's ongoing. And it's really just you know, providing value and, and letting people continue to get more and more value out of what they're already paying for on an ongoing basis. And um and that's, I would say, one of the things in 2024 and early 2025 that we're we are the most excited about. Okay. Well, thank you very much for a very interesting conversation, Jeremy. Um, I want to thank you for your time and your insight. It certainly appears you're, you're on your way to being a master of implementation because you've grown your company very impressively. And I yeah. want to congratulate you on that. So thank you for your time and thank you for all the insights this afternoon. Thank you. Appreciate it. Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. The Implementers podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.